Um, welcome everybody uh, to uh, Alan Worth um, here on 18th Street. This is the um, first in-person um, event that we posted here. Uh, this exhibition opened, Louise Bourgeois, Once There Was a Mother, opened um, September 8th. Was our first, it is our first show in this new space. Um, committed to uh, additions, printmaking, and how that is part of an artist's larger practice. Um, what else would I say about that? Welcome. We have uh, Felix Harlan is with us tonight, longtime uh, collaborator of Louise's. Uh, they're going to have great insights. And <coughs> Maggie Wright, executive director, director of the Easton Foundation which is Louise's uh, foundation, and also, interestingly, I think, used to print with Felix at Harlan and Weaver. So we have two people here who knew uh, Louise well and collaborated with her uh, in the uh, printmaking studio and more. So they're gonna tell us about that tonight, and there will be a Q&A. Um, in fact, when I asked that earlier, they said, yes, definitely Q&A, so get your questions ready. We like Q&A. Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, right take it from there. Um, thank you. Uh, Welcome, everyone. Uh, great to be here. Oh, yeah. So, can you hear us if we talk without the mics? Is that okay for okay. Well, filmmaking? Yeah. Thank you to Anders and the whole crew here at um, the 18th Street Hauser and Worth. It's a real pr privilege to be here and to see all the work uh, displayed so beautifully. Um, some things I haven't seen for a while, and uh, particularly this big one behind me. And I think Maggie's going to lead off because she has a good, um, a very good sense of the, uh, the time, you know, the times and when these pieces were made, the sequencing and what Louise was doing in her other work besides two-dimensional work. Great. So. Um, well, I also want to extend my gratitude to, oh, to ha uh, Hauser and Wirth, but also to Felix, who uh, I had the very lucky opportunity to work with for many years, mm. many years ago. Um, oh, you think I need the microphone? Thank you. Yeah, um, Maggie was right out of, um, which one was it? I went to Rhode Island School of Design and School Printmaking. Design. In 1996, I cold called Felix and Carol and sent in a resume and somehow mm. we the hired jackpot. Her, so. yeah. We were lucky, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Um, and I have to say that the attention to detail, the attention to process, watching an artist create an image, you know, we worked with Harlan, we've worked with many different artists, uh, seeing that kind of trajectory of an image take place over printmaking, which is very unique through state proofs, um, that kind of influence has affected me to this day, even in the work I do at the foundation. So we're very lucky to right. be here. And we have a lot of great insights through Felix, of course, because he's an yes. incredible knowledge and a, a deep friendship, I think, with Louise. Yes, uh, extended I, uh, out of their collaborative relationships. So. Spent quite a lot of time in that, her little house on 20th Street. Was, uh, um, we were going to start with this yeah. large scale self portrait, um, which is ironically the last piece, uh, one of the last pieces that Harlan and Weaver made mm -hmm. with Louise with all these little individual plates. So we're sort of starting at the end to go to the beginning. Uh, the clock was a very recurrent motif for Louise. She really liked the sort of passing of time, marking the passing of time. Uh, there's some very funny videos on YouTube of Louise with the metronome where she speeds it up if she's feeling very nervous um, and then slows it down when she's feeling peaceful. So this sort of sense of time and passing of time was really important to her. Um, and this one obviously is a 24 hour clock and the hands are at the num uh, numbers 19 and 11. Uh, Louise was born in 1911 in Paris on Christmas mm. Day. Uh, she was born into a family of tapestry restorers, so her mother was a weaver and a seamstress, an expert seamstress, and she would restore all these tapestries, these vintage tapestries, that then would be sold in Paris in the Father's Tapestry Gallery. So they'd bring in these sort of threadbare, kind of ruined uh, textiles, and Louise grew up watching her mother repair these things and often helped her. Uh, in the tapestry gallery, helping her to repair these things. Um, but all of this experience was tainted by her mother's illness. We think her mother had the Spanish influenza, which she probably acquired in 1918 and never fully recovered. And this sort of chronic illness was a, you know, kind of a weight on the family. Uh, and Louise actually ended up dropping out of school in high school to really take care of her, her mother and be sort of a nurse. It was a reversal of roles. 
Um, and in 1932, when Louise was 20, her mother succumbed to the illness and passed away. So this was a huge devastation for Louise. Obviously, uh, she expressed a lot of energy into trying to keep her mother alive. Then her mother dies. It was kind of a betrayal and an abandonment for her. This really influenced her later work. Um, often this story gets mixed up, mixed up with the story of the father. Um, Louise's father was sort of a serial philanderer, very charming, very domineering. Uh, he brought in uh, uh, an English governess into the family to teach the children English. He ended up having an affair with her under the same roof of the family for 10 years. Uh, so when Louise fought, found out about this, she also felt very betrayed by him. So it was kind of a double betrayal between him and the mother who clearly let this happen. Um, so the foundation of her work is sort of based on this polarity between the mother and the father, the male and the female, this tension that arised from these family dynamics. Uh, so 1932, again, her mother dies, she's 20 years old, that's when she starts studying art. And we can kind of fast forward, because biography, 70 years is a lot to cover, so we won't cover it all. Uh, but she arrives in New York in 1938, and um, part of the reason I guess we wanted to talk about this piece a little bit, and, and starting with the cloth work, is that uh, I think this, her work in cloth and in fabric is sort of established uh, in the 1990s. She starts working with fabric. Um, and this is also about the same time that Felix is really working with her. So it's very interesting to think as she pivots back towards a mother, mother and identifying with the mother, she's also um, very active in printmaking at that time. Um, but you can see again with motherhood uh, themes, here she is pregnant, she adopts a child, Michelle, and then she's pregnant, she has her first child, then she has her, oh, she's pregnant again, has her second child. Um, then, you know, we move through a few more decades and then it's kind of Felix time when we get uh. to around here. Um, so I think we'll kind of talk to him now about how well, you we met We even Louise have an amputee and, now too. Yeah, there's an amputee, topiary, very important mm -hmm. image for her. You know, I think in this piece she's bringing in a lot of different thematic elements uh, that recur throughout her work. And again, the passing of time and the clock. Um, you know, bringing in these fabric pieces that were from her own trousseau, so to speak, or her own closets. Um, this piece, I believe, was not actually hers, but was found for her and obviously has this beautiful LB on it. Um, but I just want to, you know, sort of want to establish this sort of sense of, of what she went through with her mother, how those things affected her later work herself as a mother, and then uh, when we get to the late 80s when Felix meets her, um, she's just sort of had her big retrospective in 1982 at the Museum of Modern Art, so all of these print publishers are now kind of coming out of the woodwork, they want to work with her, they want to sort of exploit the printmaking um, that she had not done since the 40s. So in the 40s she was going to Atelier 17, she developed her uh, print portfolio called He Disappeared Into Complete Silence, of which there's an example in the vitrine back there. Um, but she really kind of neglects printmaking for almost, what would you say, 30 years. Yeah, until the, well, the early 80s, yeah, yeah. basically. Um, and then returns <clears throat> to it at the end, and, and Felix is very lucky to meet her at that point. So maybe, yeah, I was, yeah we want to hear how you met her and how that all <laughs> happened. Well, I was introduced to Louise by um, a lithographer named Judith Solodkin. Um, Judith lived in the Chelsea neighborhood and would see Louise out on her stoop, and so Judith one day introduced herself to Louise, and um, they began to converse, and uh, they subsequently worked on, lith on, lith on lithographs together, but I think Louise had a special affinity for copper. She liked metal, um, you know, these are the materials that she worked with in her sculptures, um, bronze, copper, different kinds of metals, so I think the choice of materials was always significant for her. And um, because she had worked at Atelier 17 with um, Stanley Hayter, she knew how to engrave. Um, that was one of the things they did there, and it was important to her, and she wanted to get back into doing that. Uh, so I came along, and um, at their sort of, I was introduced by a publisher, Peter Bloom. And we did a print here. Can we have the spider, the Peter Bloom spider? Um, this was, I think I first worked with Louise um, right around uh, 1986, somewhere in there. And we began to work more and more. Yes, this is the one. 
Okay. So this was the first spider print I printed for Peter Bloom, and it came from Louise's studio. You can see the, the background is very scratched up. It was probably in a pile of copper that had been lying around in her basement studio for who knows how long, you know. So um, I was given the spider. It was already drawn, and my job was just to print it. I proofed it a couple of times, and that, by that I mean I tried to get the best possible impression off that metal plate to show her. And I think it was done pretty much in one state. It was just like she liked it, that was it. We just additioned it. Um, it's a dry point, and um, I forget the size of the addition. But after that, and after we worked on a portfolio called Anatomy, also for Peter Bloom, Louise began to get more and more into the process. And eventually, uh, she had a big studio out in Brooklyn on Dean Street. And her original press was out there. It was not in very good condition. Um, and it actually wasn't a very good press either. But uh, <laughs> she had printed on it you know, when she was young in the 1930s or maybe the 40s. And so it was important to her. And when it was brought back into her house on 20th Street, that made a very significant difference to the amount of work she was doing. Because our studio, Harlan Weaver, is on Canal Street. And you know, by the time that I went up there, I brought a plate back, printed it, it dried. She wouldn't see it for like three days. And that, she very wasn't, frustrating wasn't too place. happy about that. You know, she really wanted the immediate effect of seeing the print right after shit was drawn, you know. So uh, I would put them in folded up blotters and bring them up to her. She had a small butcher block table by her kitchen and then she would look at them and maybe the next morning she would look at them and then draw on them, always lots of drawing on the prints. And um, we'd take it from there. But we started with this one because um, this is like really late in my working relationship with Louise. But I think it's interesting because all of these plates within the circle are, are dry points printed on cloth. Um, some of them are blue, as you can see. Some of them are printed in black. And um, there's some hand coloring also. So yeah, oftentimes when I worked on images for her, I wasn't really sure what would happen to them. If, if we didn't make an addition out of them, you know, basically it would disappear somewhere and, um, and then reappear in this form, which um, I essentially, the, my only contribution to this was to the, uh, to the little dry points. Um, she decided on. Ah, well, dry point, here's a good example of a dry point. Yeah, this, um, the gallery has kindly allowed us to pull this one out. Um, and it's that's also actually one of the one of the pieces. Oh, it's yes. this one here. here. Yeah. yeah, here it is at the bottom. It's um, you know giving birth. So um, a dry point is when you scratch into a piece of copper with any sharp material. It could be a diamond point. It could be um, tool hardened steel. Anything like that will make an impression uh, onto the surface of the metal. And then when you ink it up and wipe it, the ink clings to the burr that's been produced by the, um, by the tool. It has, generally has a kind of soft appearance. It's not a hard line, it's a very soft line. Uh, Louise favored these techniques. She favored dry point and she favored engraving because no acid was involved when she was a young mother and trying to work in their home on 18th Street. She did not want to have acid in the house because there were young children around. So she gravitated more towards these kind of dry techniques, um, you know, dry point engraving and so forth. It wasn't the story that when the press was brought in, oh gosh, sorry, um, Louise's son, Jean-Louis Bourgeois Jean -Louis, yeah. um, saw that this press was being brought into Louise's house and remembered it being in his bedroom. He remembered seeing the press in his bedroom because, yeah. you know, his mother would... <laughs> I don't know how big this apartment was. Yeah. It was on 18th Street. Yeah. But, um, but interesting yeah. how in the early years with her young children, the printmaking was very much, you know, she's working at home. She's not using acid because of the kids. So she starts with dry point and engraving. Mm -hmm. Has the press in, in her son's bedroom. 
And then when she re, you know, reapproaches printmaking again 30 years later, she starts with those same kind of elements. Um, I wanted to mention one thing with the spider since it was up. I think uh, a lot of people know Louisa's spiders. Obviously, they're a very famous icon of Louisa's. Um, many of you probably know that the spider symbolized Louisa's mother. Um, again, Louise, Louisa's mother was a seamstress, a weaver. She identified the spider in its diligence and its careful weaving of webs with that, that same kind of approach. Um, she also identified it as a self-portrait, you know, that the spider is making its imagery out of its, or its web out of its body, and that she thought, as a sculptor, that is what she's doing. She's using her, in relationship to her body, she's not necessarily using art history or outside resources. It's all coming from her internal kind of psychic landscape, um, which is interesting that this one ends on the spider, too. Mm -hmm. But I think it's fascinating when we are going through kind of the dates with some of this material and Felix's first work with the spider, with Peter Bloom, and then with this incredible portfolio called Eau de Ma Mer. Um, that illustrated yeah. book is the <clears throat> first kind of instance where she really sets out the symbolism of the spider as being directly related to her mother. So there's this great text that comes with this portfolio. Um, and this is kind of an interesting image because it's the spider giving birth, right? The so. spider's giving birth, and we assume if the spider is Louise's mother, then the child um, is Louise herself, yeah. but we don't know. This could be an image of Louise's birth. <laughs> but um, it's going to be hard for some of you to see it, so we'll have these out uh, when this is over, and you can, you can ask to see them. Um, but she's establishing this <clears throat> link between uh, the spider and her mother at the very same time she's beginning to make those huge spider sculptures. So I think the first spider sculpture was 1994. The Eau de Mamere mm. print portfolio is 95. So the prints are happening simultaneously. This exploration printmaking is happening simultaneously with her sculptural works, and I think directly influencing each other, mm. um, which you also see in the later fabric works as well. Uh, I would point out with this one that um, Louise also had a seamstress uh, named Mercedes Katz, and I'm assuming that Mercedes did all the lettering. Is that correct? Or was that sent to I Paris? So. Is that right? <laughs> but anyway, so. you know, later in life, um, printing on fabric and then embellishing it with um, embroidery. And up at the top of this one, we even have one little etching over on the left and two of the, um, the inkjet prints that resemble her watercolors. So this, this one kind of combines a whole bunch of stuff that was going on in her, in her house, her workshop. Um, and then I think as, as sort of Louise entrusted you, like, you know, you started working on these, you, you get the single plate with the spider, you haven't really done the plate making for that. I think a similar thing happened with anatomy. And then mm. Louise kind of starts thinking Felix is okay. You know, yeah, he's not gonna. <laughs> um, and you become more entrusted with uh, being there, being on site with her. Yeah. And I think it became more experimental after that, would you say? Yeah, I think. Uh, once that little press came into the, her basement studio, I was on call frequently, you know, to be there because maybe she had an idea, she had a drawing she wanted to work with, and then, you know, she'd say, well, can you come up now? Or maybe, <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, yes, I would. Um, I told a collector that recently, and he said, you mean you do hard schools? And I said, yeah, sure, who wouldn't, you know, if Louise Ward Bourgeois wants you to come and work with her, who would say no, you know? And she never came to the studio, is that uh, right? She never set foot in the studio. Uh, she would, uh, when she and Jerry Gorovoy, her main assistant, were driving over the Manhattan Bridge from the big studio on Dean Street, uh, they would stop on the corner of Canal and Eldridge, and those were back in the days of payphones. so Jerry would, you know, put a quarter in the payphone and call call the shop, and I'd go down with either proofs or a plate or whatever it was Louise was expecting to see. And those were lovely times. I actually wish I'd taken a photograph of that, but I didn't, uh, didn't think of it. But she'd be there with her little beret, looking very pleased to have something fresh to look at, you know. It was always about the next thing, you know, about what can we do next. Um, well, we had talked about that a little bit because I think obviously for printmakers, the end goal is an addition, right? You're, you're creating a plate that you can then addition and make, mm -hmm. you know, exact replicas of the plate. Um, but Louise was much more interested in the process than in the additioning. So as I remember in the studio, you would often have multiple plates going and 
there would be no additioning happening because she would just want to keep making plates and making images and we wouldn't have time to yeah, always Yeah, for about a long period of time when she was really, really focused on making the etchings, um, she would just be not wanting to wait for additions to be made. I mean, we would try and do that. Um, you know, at the shop we had several good printers who could do that work, but um, mostly she wanted to continue to work on new images. And a lot of that came out through giving her state proofs. A state proof is just something you pull. I think I might have a state proof in here, do we? Maybe stamp a state lines. proof is, yes, here's a nice one. A state proof is just something you pull to see where an image is before, uh, so the artist can make a decision. Do they like it? Do they want to do more to it? Should they remove something, add to it? Um, this is a state proof um, of, um, a print that later became known as Stamp of Memories. It also resembles her St. Sebastian um, compositions, the um, St. Sebastian, you know, being pierced with the arrows. But this one is curious because it has a little cat face over here. <laughs> and I assume maybe Louise's face as well. But the three circles in the headdress or the hat represent the three eggs of um, Michel, Jean-Louis, and Alain the three boys. So, um, it's a, it, I think it, it's appropriate for the theme of the show, you know, the motherhood kind of thing we're talking about here. But this particular plate didn't stay like that. It, it was, you know, it changed quite a bit before the additioning was done. When we talked about that, how much um, Louise liked well, there's a, there's a beautiful interview you did with Debbie Y, actually, for mm. Debbie's unfolding portrait show at the MoMA, um, where you guys talk about the permanence of the, pa of the plate, of the image being in the plate. Yeah. And that, that was sort of um, a sense of security for Louise. I mean, Louise worked on this very high level of emotional reaction and psychology. And having, having that plate, or the image on the plate, the matrix, remain constant, mm -hmm. let her explore a variety of things within the various print stages, right? And then she was able to kind of return to the image after she'd sort of exercised whatever demons she was trying to do with that particular image, which I think was yeah. extremely unique within printmaking in her practice that she had that ability to. Yeah, I think that the deeply engraved piece of copper for her um, suggested permanence of some sort. You know, we know that copper will degrade, but it's very hard. It's a pretty hard material. And then the fact that there were more than one can be pulled off a plate meant that those images could just keep going out there. You know, it was not, the image itself could be replicated and it could be extended and more and more people presumably could see it. Uh, one of her favorite things to do was to draw on those state proofs. Uh, and then the ideas would evolve. Um, sometimes the image would be abandoned completely. If, if it became overworked, she was done with it. Or, or if she had sort of, um, Exhausted the idea, basically. You know, she was on to the next idea. You know, ah, this one is a nice print. It's um, titled "The Bad Mother," which gets us a little bit into the motherhood uh, thing. Um, out on the back, why don't you show the back? <laughs> it says, uh, "The mother is wasting the milk." So you know, she's essentially a bad mother. Um, the bad, um, a mother can be either a good mother and a bad mother at once, at the same time. The child, how the child perceives the mother depending on the nourishment or the mother's presence. It, when the mother goes away, the child might think that they, the mother is a bad mother. Um, I don't have any good mother prints. Um, <laughs> I think they're mostly bad mother prints, but uh, you know. Well, this is a bad child print, kind of, I think. Yeah, these are, these are two children. boys. Um, they're fixated on the breast, you know. The boys are fighting for the breast. The, I, I probably won't speculate on who they are, but they might be close family members. Um, so the breast is the all-important thing for the child, you know, at a certain stage of their development. You know, and this has been... Um, written about extensively um, by psychologists, you know, of child development. So, um, yeah, we should mention that um, Louise was incredibly well-read in psychoanalysis. I know of some of you that have read her biographies. 
Uh, she started going, uh, undergoing psychoanalysis in 1952, went through very intensely until about 66, 67, and then continued to see her analyst until 1985. So she was very, very steeped in analytic theory. Not only did she go through an analysis herself, but she was very well read uh, in all the, you know, the different theories. And she was uh, a big fan of Melanie Klein and Donald Winnicott, of course, who both talk a lot about the, the breast, the bad mm -hmm. mother, good mother, things like this. So yeah. um, these were things that she was also you know, we can see them happening in her imagery, but she was also directly referencing some of this, this analytic theory. I think I'm going to say that's a good mother. Oh, that's a good She's, mother. It's very sweet, actually. A very sweet mother. Yeah. The boy, again, I don't know. He might well, be being a little bad. I don't know. He's just identified um, with his uh, genitalia, but we know he's a boy, <laughs> so we know she's the mother. So anyway. <laughs> um, actually, that print, that might give us a good reason to kind of move this way towards some of these fabric prints. Um, because this print is done on paper, which, you know, as Felix started working with Louise, most of the prints were done on paper, and then they started being printed in cloth. So that same print uh, is there at I the very end on the right in the cloth. You know, Oops. Felix can talk about this ah, a bit, okay. but Louise really loved the variable of the cloth pieces. Um, you know, the, the stains, the different creases. You can see in this one even how she folded her, her napkins, how they would have been folded in the closets. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't actually ask you about this too, but so in the late, well, I'm sorry, the early 90s, mid 90s, when she starts developing her spider theme and she's kind of returning to the mother, uh, Jerry comes in for work one day and she asks him to pull all of the clothing and, you know, things that she'd saved out of the closets and bring them down to her. Um, she's in her mid 80s at this point. I think she's kind of understanding her, her mortality and she realizes what's gonna happen to all these clothes. Um, so she starts very much incorporating them into her art, and she really deals with them in kind of two different scenarios, whereas if they're a full garment that are particularly evocative of a certain place or memory, if it's a cocktail dress or a nightgown, that would be very sort of Proustian, like she would go back into her memories and, and identify a certain time or specific place with that. Those pieces she probably would not have cut. So if you see a cell piece or a pole piece with those fabric um, garments hanging, they would have been of a certain memory. She would not have wanted to cut those. Um, some goes, I think, with some of these uh, napkins and things. She didn't cut these. As she got into more contemporary clothing and stuff like this, she would cut them and make sculptural figures, as you can see with this blue piece here and the pink piece here. Those are made out of little pieces of her clothes. Um, but at the same time that she's pulling all these clothes out of the closet, I mean, did you see the clothes coming out of the closets? No, I would. Um, I remember uh, Jerry coming down and said, can you print etchings on cloth? And, you know, we probably would have done um, the piece already that Jane is holding up. That's, I think it's like a 1999 mm -hmm. print, but, you know, we took care of the plates. So um, I said, well, to Jerry, well, yeah, you can print out cloth. I've, I've heard of it. It's, you know, I think Whistler did it. Um, I think it was, you know, various artists um, going back in time have experimented with it. But, you know, for us, uh, it did, there were challenges to printing on cloth. A lot of the cloth was old and fragile. And, you know, you're running it through a press under tremendous amounts of pressure. And we would always have to back it with paper so that um, the back of the cloth was protected from the roller. So this actually happens to be a really good impression on the cloth, um, cotton whether it's woven cotton or it's cotton rag paper, is very good at absorbing ink. So both the impression that Jane's holding up on um, Hannah Muller paper and the cloth are about equivalent, I think, in quality of the uh, image. And that's something that printers kind of um, obsess over, you know. I mean, I think, uh, I don't think Louise um, was quite so, finicky about it, but a printer's goal is to always make the best possible impression off the plate, the best possible representation off the plate. And I would think, you know, when, when you have these very unique pieces of cloth, like this one you can see has her LBs initialed in the corner, I remember it was being somewhat stressful when we had yeah, these absolutely gorgeous be, pieces going the, down, we wouldn't know if they would work out. You know, the fabric is old, it's kind of fragile, and um, there are only so many of the pieces in the house. So, you know, to kind of lose one because, you know, the pressure wasn't enough or because it creased and tore when it was going through the press, that was always a kind of um, 
you know, that was a bad moment, you know, you want to... <laughs> it's not like you can pull another piece of paper off the pile. These were kind of unique things. Yeah, some of the early ones, as I remember, were from uh, Robert Goldwater's handkerchiefs. And Robert Goldwater was Louise's husband, so she kept all of his handkerchiefs and um, Yeah, we know, began scarves. with um, her handkerchiefs, his handkerchiefs, um, you know, things from the dining table. Um, I don't think we, I don't think I ever printed on anything that was like a shirt or a blouse. It was always like sort of flat material that would lend itself to going through a press. But again, all this fabric work is happening kind of simultaneously, all the printmaking is happening simultaneously with the fabric sculpture. So she's really reinvigorating that, that part of, uh, you know, her printmaking, coming back into the printmaking process uh, at the same time as she's developing this really whole new body of sculpture that's identifying again back to her mother, where her mother's a seamstress and a weaver. So she's wanting to use those fabrics. And it's psychologically a sense of reparation and bringing things back together after she'd spent you know, many decades destroying and, and, and aggressively hacking away at marble and harder materials. These are much softer materials, and it's sort of showing her trajectory at the end of her life coming back towards this identification. They may be kind of precious to her because they, yeah. they bring up memories of family and when she was married and her mother. And, uh, and very intimate. I mean, I think these yeah, pieces intimate. are, you know, you, you knowing that they belong to her, that she may have used this napkin, I mean, it brings a level of intimacy that maybe some of the other work does. Um, doesn't. I mean, yeah. So what else do we have here? Uh, we wanted to talk about maybe the do not abandon me. Do not me. abandon me. Okay. Um, this is a really good example of what would be a variable wipe in printmaking, which again is also not maybe an ideal. Just hold it up as long as you can. I know it's heavy. So, yeah, this one is framed um, from the gallery and it's called Do Not Abandon Me and the date is 2000 on it. Uh, it was printed first on paper. We were using Japanese papers at the time, kind of exploring different kinds of paper. Um, you know, there used to be some really great art supply places in New York. So we would source different papers. I just wanted to show Louise things that she hadn't done before. Um, you know, things that might interest her, like different qualities of paper. And then it was printed on cloth. So you see, in a certain sense, the, the paper in this case, took a better impression, you know, the, um, although, as I said, cloth, cotton rag is, is a good paper to print on, but, um, I mean, to me, I think it's this, this gradation and the solid black are very satisfying. This, of course, is the mother with the baby attached to the umbilical cord. Um, the umbilical cord also goes to the mother's navel. And that yeah, is yet again a um, umbilical cord image based on, it's an engraving printed on cloth. This is all dry point. So you can see the difference in the line quality. This is a kind of soft line and the, the engraving is a much hard, more hard and sharp kind of line. And normally um, you would get that kind of black, really deep black background a, through a technique called aquatint. Um, Louise again didn't really like the, et the etching solution, the acid, and so she really liked these variable wipes, which are also get a kind of a mon monotype or mono. I think we're calling it monoprint. Yeah, what are we calling it? <laughs> monoprint quality. It's um, monoprint and monotype, so I think Anders clarified that it should be monoprint. So we'll go with it, we'll go with monoprint. And this is basically just leaving a lot of ink on the surface of the copper and wiping the center. Um, this is with the tarlatan, which is a rag that you use to, you know, scrub away most of the ink, and then going in by hand to sort of bring the lines out. Uh, Louise liked to see the corners of the metal, um, the impression of the corners of the metal, so it's kind of a feature of her work. You, you'll always notice, in the etchings at least, that there's a darkening on the sides. That was one of her kind of devices she liked to do. I think it established the uh, rectangle very firmly. You know. yeah, she always had a very, she, there was a <coughs> tension to the image process, even though there's some ambivalence maybe in the concepts or the themes, there was always an intention in how the image looked and how it sat on the page. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if you want to talk about how the variable wiping started, or uh, yeah, was that okay. her idea? <laughs> well, <laughs> she you know, went to Atelier 17, which we mentioned, and uh, Stanley Hayter, like to have very richly wiped plates. He liked surface 
ink, um, and he was also working with engraving mostly, but he didn't like a clean wipe. They would call it like printing like a calling card or like a letterhead when you, when you wiped a plate very, very clean. So there was always a tendency to leave some ink on the surface. Um, I was trained, and Carol, my partner, were trained in a, a different kind of concept of, of uh, wiping plates, and so we would tend to wipe them clean. But I remember one time I was away, and Louise was really actively making plates. And I was gone, and Louise didn't want to wait for me to show up. So she asked uh, her assistant, Jerry, if he would wipe a plate for her. And I don't think Jerry had any training in um, etching, but I think he probably had seen me wiping some plates down in the basement. And he did one, and he left a lot of tone uh, all, around the, all around the image, and Louise loved it. That was just perfectly what she <laughs> <laughs> so, That's what she'd been looking for. You know, it's humbling sometimes, you know. When, uh, <laughs> You know, and you've been training all these years, and then... <laughs> anyway, I, you had to be prepared for anything with these. It was one of the things that kept it interesting, actually. You know, she'd throw stuff at you, see how you'd respond, you know. And as Jerry, um, you know, as Louise's sort of career really continued to become more and more all international, shows all over the world, Jerry would go and install these exhibitions, mm -hmm. and Felix would be be entrusted to go up and be with her during those yeah, times. Yeah, after a few years, few... I was kind of entrusted to be in the house, because the house was full of valuable things, I mean, incalculably valuable. So um, somebody had to be there to answer the door and make sure who, who's there, what do they want. And um, I would cook lunch um, as best I could. And, <laughs> and um, then I would wait there till 6, when Louise would go upstairs to bed. and. Uh, I would sort of watch to make sure she made it up the stairs, okay, because they were very steep stairs. And at this point, she was probably late in her 80s. So um, that was also very good for me because I could just be working and um, just tossing ideas around, see what she was wanting to do. Yeah, I do think this is really interesting because Louise is sort of notorious for wanting to work alone. She didn't like having a lot of assistance in this studio. She didn't really like having music. Um, you were generally supposed to hang out kind of in the background. She would go to even her huge, huge Brooklyn studio where she had a welder mm. that she worked with and people that would assist her, but they were usually in the background until she was ready for that moment to happen. So the, the fact that you're kind of around, I mean, I think in printmaking, that's kind of an, an, like a, yeah, I mean, when we're working in the shop with an artist, you know, they're there. We, don't, we try not to bother them if they don't want to be talked to. But it is a kind of an intimate situation. They have to allow you to see how they work. They have to allow you to see their mistakes, if there are any. And you can make suggestions, and you have to be prepared for them to reject that, if that's, if that's where they're at, you know, so. Uh, one of my favorite stories, I think, with Felix is the shock of the Ah, yeah. the new or she would he would print yeah. all these these proofs for her down in the basement press and then she would ask you to put them in blotters we had a stack of blotters folded into fours um, and they would fit to her left uh, when she was at her little table when she, where she worked and i would insert the 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 new prints into there they were torn down so they fit exactly into the blotters and then she might leave them overnight and then come down in the morning and have a little breakfast, and then just open up the portfolio for the shock of seeing the image for the first time. You know, it was a kind of moment of real stimulation for her. And I think you even described her coming, if you were coming up from the basement with a print, she would turn. Oh yeah, she would not want to we see it. Not want to see it. <laughs> <laughs> not want to see it until she was ready to see it, and at that exact moment. The unveiling. Then it would the be. The immediate impact. Yes, right. the impact, the shock of the visual image, you know. Um, one other thing with the cloth, I guess, is the not laws of nature. We were going to sort, mm -hmm. uh, sort of in there for questions and stuff. But the laws of nature portfolio cloth, I'm sorry, not portfolio, cloth book is in this vitrine over there. Do we want to walk over there? And yeah, I think so. Um, Do you want to bring those? Jane's up? prepared. So here's the laws of nature here. And this is, of course, Louise's, he disappeared. This is the, uh, one of the copies that she did in 1947 at Stanley William Hayter's Atelier 17. Uh, actually, one of the projects that Carol and Felix first 
sort of started developing with Louise in the late 80s, early 90s, was the second edition of this particular book, which came out uh, in 2005 and has hand-colored elements. Um, but The Laws of Nature was done in 2005? Yeah, dates in there. Um, 2003. 2003. Oh, gosh, yeah. I'm off. Um, and you know, again, there's this intimacy of the cloth, and especially with the cloth book. I mean, Louise did collect children's books, so we have a collection of children's books at the foundation, and some of those were actually old cloth children's books. So some are at the foundation still? Yeah, well, they're uh, in storage, kind of. Uh, actually, but we have evidence of them. Um, and then having this, this sort of you know, child's cloth book that we all kind of are familiar with, uh, explored in, in with much different imagery than you would see in a, a yeah. child's book. <laughs> um, and then you can see the difference uh, with these same prints. Yeah, we auditioned paper. on paper first because I really wasn't sure how to make a book in cloth. But we consulted with some people who knew how to do it. And so it was auditioned on paper, and then 10 copies were made on cloth. And these are cloths from like her um, curtains, I think, upholstery fabric. And the cover is made of um, etching blankets, etching felts. So it, it, it's based on a children's game called Fair Le Galipet, is it? Elise will have to do the French. Elise, Fair Le Galipet? It's a, um, from my understanding, it's like a somersault game with a child between the arms, but it also has very heavy sexual. Yes. Yes. That's right. Like okay. Yeah, you go. Yes. 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 So the child is. You can. Um, she's spinning. The mother is spinning the child around, and um, in between her arms. Yeah. Oh, this is the last one. You can see she's succeed successfully let the go of the has, child by the end. The child has landed on all fours. Uh, <laughs> she is supreme. So at the end. <laughs> There with her little high and you heels. know she's the mother because she has very long hair and high heels, just in case you. <laughs> just in case you might confuse. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Louise um, had very long hair at one point in her life. So. She did, and a lot of these early drawings, and you can see even in this, he disappeared here. She liked that kind of intense, uh, linear, very closely, um, you know, marked lines, mm -hmm. which were always often symbolic of hair. And engraving lends itself to that. That's one of the things that engraving is really good at is cutting densely uh, packed together lines. Um, and you can see in some of these that the children's, well, I don't know if you can call them a child quite, um, but the son's arms are actually merged with the mother's arms. So they are at one in some yeah. of these images. Um, so the fact that the separation occurs at the end is pretty significant. And then the release at the end. Yeah. Um, I think we're about time, right? I don't know, what, is that good? Yeah. yeah? Um, yeah, yeah, we love questions. questions. Sure. It would make things a lot easier. So. Ah, yes. Anders. Anders. Thanks. Um, question about the 1947 um, display period that completes that the version that you all printed in 2005. Yeah. So, how did that work? With, where were the plates? Did you walk in with the 1947 plates? And did you have to do much to them? Well, the 1947 plates were lost. Um, and actually, Debbie Y, Louise had L Debbie Y go out and scour all the print shops to see if they could find the original plates. They've never turned up. So Louise at one point said, I'm not doing any more work until this book is finished. Mm -hmm. And this was from the new version of this one, which is parable number nine. And the, this exhibition is actually named after some of the uh, text parable. It's alternately called the Hudson River, I, because I think you know, it sort of evokes the river, which was not too far from her house. But uh, to answer the question, the public library on 42nd Street had an original copy of this portfolio. I think there are 13 known in the world at the moment. And um, we made photogravures from the public library's copies. And gravure is kind of a shallow technique, whereas engraving is a very steep and V-shaped line. So Louise didn't like the sort of shallow, soft line of the photogravure. 
So she asked me to engrave over the uh, gravure lines, which I did. So this is actually this, you can actually touch these and feel the bump of the uh, ink, whereas um, a gra uh, photogravure is very soft and shallow. Uh, I learned a tremendous amount doing that. Um, I could actually see how she cut the lines. She would go from different directions sometimes. You can see where a line begins and a line ends. So um, we finished the portfolio and there was some additional text that um, the curator Debbie Rye Why wrote to accompany the second printing. And the second uh, printing also had um, hand colored editions. Yeah. So in this one you can see there's a little blue window. Um, there's some red elements on plate number seven, which is, you know, you don't have here, but uh, so different hand colored editions would, ha would happen among some of the plates. Uh, the museum was, it was given to the Museum of Modern Art print department as a, um, just basically like a fundraiser, you know. And um, the museum was worried that to tell the difference between the originals and then the final printing, they thought it would be good to have some additions in color mm -hmm. just to distinguish between the first and the second sets. And then at the end, there's also an additional print of a spider. So in all, it makes a kind of, it's a very significant work of hers, actually. The, this well, she was quite yeah. distraught that she'd lost those plates, right? Yeah. She continued to, I mean, I remember, I think I started at Harlan Weaver in 96, and this wasn't done until 2005, mm -hmm. and it was a constant project. Yeah, it was, it was like she kept returning to it, like we need to finish that, we need to finish that, we need to finish that. So she, went, she didn't want to let it go. She'd made a couple of attempts, but in the end it was the gravure and engraving that worked the best. You know. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, could you talk a little bit about how you uh, test uh, your print making with um, paper versus fabric? So it was one question, and then I had a second one sure. too. Mm -hmm. Um, when you were working with editions with Louise, did she have a preference for paper choices? And how did that part of the process go? Well, we would generally print on paper first. And then um, if Louise decided that it would be a good image to do on cloth, then a small edition would be pulled on cloth, usually in the range of maybe eight prints, something like that. Um, and those would often be unique if the cloth itself was a unique piece. Yeah, depending so, on what it was. Uh, as for paper, so you know. But you have to test the, the, the fabric like you did your paper. So, mm -hmm. like, did, did you have to bring in different samples of cloth to try to be close to her cloth? How did you. I think um, we might have had some uh, cloth to, to test on. Basically, I vaguely remember having linen, some was, linen that was brought yeah, in, samples. There were some linen samples. Mm -hmm. But really it was a little scary because um, most of the time I wasn't really prepping. You know, I was just going to do it. And if it was being done at her, on her press in her, in her home, there was really no way for me to, to find out. You know, we just did it, you know. Yeah. But in general, you know, I knew that cotton fiber prints really well when you get it wet enough and then you put a piece of paper behind it just to push a little harder. Her choices of papers were, um, she wasn't very particular about paper. You know, I would, I would bring um, all the basics, Arsh, Reeves, Hanamula, anything like that. And um, she um, was generally okay with whatever, you know. I mean, she would draw on anything. If you put, if there was paper in front of her, she'd draw on it. You know, if, even if it was like a, I remember seeing a beautiful drawing she did once on a, you know, those old fashioned fashion cardboard things you get from the dry cleaners that, to stiffen your shirt or your blouse. There was a beautiful drawing on one of those, you know, completely uh, non-acid free, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one thing that we didn't, we were going to touch on earlier also with Felix kind of mentioned that there are historical antecedents in printing on cloth. You know, Whistler had printed some. I think Enzer had done some prints on cloth. Mm -hmm. um, and Louise had a, 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 a gallery in 1938 in Paris where she sold prints and drawings and was very, very well read and, and familiar with all the art history and, and especially in printmaking. So I w I'm always curious if she must have known that, that, that it, it was possible, possible yeah. to print on cloth before she even asked yeah. him to do yeah. that. And you knew it was possible because you knew that I knew it was there, possible because of Whistler and I. 
I think maybe Hercules Sagers also did some experiments on cloth to just to sort of disrupt the image a little bit, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah we these are made, these actually. are later prints. Um, I I sort of stopped working with Lee's around um, 2005, I think. Um, the work, as you can see, had generally been rather small scale, and I think she was interested in going bigger. And also, because of the hand coloring that had been done on the paper prints, uh, she got really into painting on on prints and on paper. And I think these, these images came out of that um, concentrated work she did with watercolor on paper. So pretty much from here across are the ones that... Um, she rework? Hmm? She rework? I was not in, involved in those, and um, they were based on drawings. It's a different printmaking technique. Yeah. Which is, it's a dye technique, where the, the, the dye is actually going on to the, to the cloth or the paper. Uh, whereas Felix is working with more traditional printmaking techniques where you're doing intaglio and engraving and the burin work. So it's a, it's a different technique. Yeah, it's a very different But technique. it came out of, I mean, obviously, as, she, as Felix said, as she got older, bigger, um, you know, maybe more washy effects, watercolor effects, which are very hard to, to reproduce in, in, the, in the techniques that they were using. So she kind of yeah, shifted because we weren't really using Aquatint and spit bite and, you know, things like that with her. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think that, uh, can we have that little one of the, um, the tools? I brought one that I particularly like. <laughs> and it was part of the um, series called Reparation, which had a lot to do with her, um, her sewing and how they, the family would repair tapestries and old, old fabrics. So as she aged, um, I think it was more difficult for her to pull the needles through these heavy fabrics. So we made, she made this little drawing, and the title of it is Reparation. And it's a very simple print. Uh, it began as dry point, and then it progressed as engraving to end at the end. So to me, it had a kind of significance because uh, as a printer and, and you know, working on copper, I'm constantly engaging with tools and, and they're very they're very important to me. So I identified with that with that print. She would, as you can see here, she'd have the needle with the thread and then she would use the pair of pliers to pull the needle through. It, it was an assist for her. Yeah. Thank you everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. 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 Thank you.